Okay, water quality with a focus now on some of the chemical parameters that are in water. And we're going to start off talking about dissolved oxygen because that's one that a lot of folks may not fully appreciate, but they would realize when they see a fish kill how important it is. We'll talk about some of the major water quality parameters and some examples of them. Um, first of all, um, one of the things that we're going to talk about real quick here are physical water quality parameters. So we can measure how clear or cloudy the water is using a turbidimeter. It's pretty easy. We can evaluate the color, taste, and odor of the water. You, they can, there's measures of true color. There's taste tests. We can measure the temperature of the water pretty easily, thermometers. And then there's also electrical conductivity as well. So there are conductivity probes that actually measure in micro siemens how effective the water is at carrying a current. You may not realize that pure water, pure H2O, like distilled or deionized water, does not carry an electrical current. So the DO or the uh, turbid, ah, sorry, the electrical conductivity probes got two little metal prongs on it, and it tries to pass a current. And water that's like salty, like ocean water, it's got a lot of stuff in it. It passes a current really easily, so it's got high conductivity. Water that comes off like coal mine runoff. There's a lot of metals that are still in there and a lot of other things in the water. We can evaluate mine runoff by looking at conductivity. It's got a high conductivity, a high ability to pass a lot of electrical charge. Like crystal clear, pure lake water with no minerals dissolved in it. It's easily contaminated from the outside if something gets in it. Um, but one thing is it doesn't pass an electrical charge very easily. So um, lightning could strike it and theoretically a person couldn't really be impacted um, as harshly as they would be if they were in like a saltwater environment. I wouldn't be out there, like Lake Rebo's got a lot of conductivity in it. Pure, no conductivity lakes don't really exist in nature. So um, just letting you know, so don't, don't try to shock yourself. All right, biological water quality parameters. We're gonna discuss them a little bit more later on in this section in the next videos. But we can actually, and we would have done this the last week of the class, we can actually go out and find helgramites in our streams. And if we find them, we know that the water quality is good. There are certain fish like red-sided dace. They're very pollution sensitive. There are certain macro invertebrates. There are these beetles that look like, they're called water pennies. Um, you wouldn't even know them unless you were looking for them. When we find them in the water, they tell us that the water must be pretty clean and must have stayed pretty clean for them things to have tolerated living there all that time. So there are some that are pollution intolerant, and then there are other things like aquatic worms and many of the crayfish that are quite pollution tolerant. So their presence doesn't tell us a whole lot. But the presence of things like helgramites, and these are dobson fly larvae, they actually grow up and fly and look like that. The females keep their pinchers because they can continue to eat because they need to eat for their future babies. But the males, when they get their wings and fly out of the water, um, they usually lose their pinchers or their pinchers fall off. Um, so yeah, they're called helgramites or dobson flies. All right, so fish, We've got certain ones that are pollution sensitive, and there are other fish that their presence really doesn't tell us a whole lot. They can tolerate about anything. If you know a lot about fish, like carp, many of the carp, many of the Asian carp, they can tolerate pretty nasty water quality conditions. We can measure microorganisms, and we often do these with a focus on humans. Um, but some of them, like cyanobacteria, blue-green algae, when they get too numerous in the water, they steal all the oxygen from the fish at night. So during the daytime, they produce a lot of oxygen through photosynthesis, but when the sun goes down, they use all the oxygen up and fish can, can die. They also produce toxins that can make animals and people sick and fish sick too, to a certain degree. 
protozoans. There are parasites that are out there that can make people sick, viruses of all types that can make everything sick. There are viruses that infect bacteria. There are viruses that infect fish. They infect plants, they infect us. So we'll discuss some of the different methods um, for enumerating and testing microbial water quality. All right, so right now we're talking about oxygen levels. So we typically measure oxygen levels in milligrams per liter, which is the same as parts per million. And when they get below three parts per million, fish tend to start to die. Some things like catfish and carp are more tolerant, but most fish will die um, here to even here. Things like trout, smallmouth bass, not as tolerant. They like rivers and flowing waters and rapids and colder waters and cold water holds more oxygen. So they're more sensitive. Things that live in warmer waters, things that can live in more polluted waters can tolerate lower levels of oxygen for survival. When you get below a certain level, the fish eggs don't end up being able to survive. So we lose reproduction capability. Also, when oxygen levels get low, the fish don't want to reproduce or can't reproduce or too stressed. So higher oxygen levels are better for fish spawning. All right, fish activity is best as we get above six and seven. So we don't want to be down here. Oxygen levels fluctuate throughout the day. Fish kills, again, they happen in this range. And when you get below three, they usually all start to die. Things that influence oxygen. We know that when the sun is shining, photosynthesis happens. But when the sun goes down, photosynthesis stops. So if there's a whole lot of algae in the lake, we get lots of oxygen during the daytime. But when the sun goes down, those same algae are using the oxygen and will suck it all out of the water. So having a lot of algae is okay during the day, but at night, if they steal all the oxygen out of the water, or them and all the fish and all the bacteria and everything else living in the water takes all the oxygen out. The algae and the bacteria, many of them will be just fine. But fish, you take their oxygen away for even, you know, a half hour, 20 minutes. They die. They breathe through their gills. Their gills are like our lungs. And fish require dissolved oxygen in the water to live. So... Just because you could go out there and measure the oxygen levels during the daytime when the sun's up and say, oh, there's plenty of oxygen. Suffocate yourself and see how well that goes. Because it only takes being without oxygen for a little bit of time for these things to die. So oxygen levels are influenced by photosynthesis a lot. Also, warm water doesn't hold as much oxygen as cold water. Cold water can hold more oxygen. So if it's warm and sunny, that's when we have the bigger problems for losing oxygen levels. So cold water fish that live in like the north in Canada, like pike and a lot of the trout, they can't live in Florida just because the water is not cold enough down there to support higher oxygen concentrations. More waves and rapids give us more oxygen through just wave action and turbulence. The more stuff that's living in the water, the more fish, the more algae, the more um, microbiota, those things are all doing cellular respiration all the time. They're all the time using oxygen. And then at night, they're using oxygen without any additions coming from photosynthesis. So at night is when we tend to have the fish kills. Biodegradation, some things, the stuff dies, there's chemical processes that happen on the bottom. So in general, the dissolved oxygen profile for lakes and rivers looks like this. At dawn, the oxygen levels start to go up. And at night, at dusk, when the sun goes down, they crash. 
And this repeats over and over and over. They call this diurnal oxygen fluctuation. Also, we know that as the water gets warmer, if it's holding maximum amount of oxygen, so as it gets up to like 90, 98 degrees Fahrenheit, that's pretty hot, 90 to 98 Fahrenheit, right? It can't hold a lot of oxygen. But when it's cold, near freezing, it can hold almost 14 and a half milligrams per liter. When it's warm, we'll say when it's 90 degrees Fahrenheit or so, about 30 degrees Celsius. When it's 90 degrees outside, if we've got a lot of photosynthesis going on, once it gets above eight milligrams per liter or so in the water, or seven and a half, the oxygen levels bubble out. And at night, there's only seven and a half milligrams of liter per liter of oxygen left in the water. So we can have fish kills at night because the water couldn't hold as much oxygen. And there may have been a lot of photosynthesis in the day, but at night, just not enough oxygen there. So certain fish can't live in these type of warm waters. Oxygen levels can be measured by these meters, but they have to be calibrated frequently. There's also titration methods that are out there, so it's not too hard to measure oxygen. When sewage gets into a river, pond, or a stream, the sewage has a lot of fertilizer in it, nitrogen and phosphorus, and that makes a lot of bacteria grow. Also, when we have spills of stuff that the microbes in the river like, we get fish kills. So when Jim Beam caught fire over the uh, holiday break this um, December, right around Christmas and New Year's, when Jim Beam caught fire, a lot of the alcohol that had the sugar in it that was being produced ran into the Kentucky River's tributary, this big creek. And all the fish in that and then downstream for like 60 miles, many of them died. Why? Cirrhosis of the river. When they, they don't call it that, that's just what I call it. When the alcohol got into the river with all that sugar, the microorganisms that were in there really liked it. So they did a whole lot of cellular respiration as their population boomed. And microbes, they don't need oxygen. They can switch. They're facultative anaerobes. They can be aerobic or anaerobic. So the microbes, they took all the oxygen out of the water, and then they went to being anaerobic. When they did that, they sucked all the oxygen out of the water. You can imagine what it was like for the poor fish. All right, so review. When we measure turbidity and temperature, are those chemical, physical, or biological measures? There you go. That's it right there, physical. DO concentrations, when are they at the highest? At dusk or dawn? Some of these, you know, I've got these review questions up here, but I'll probably just give them to you in the form of a, of a quiz. Um, this last one, though, I'm going to probably help you out some on it. So when would you expect to have higher fluctuations and dissolved oxygen concentrations? A lagoon pond or Lake Cumberland? So a sewage lagoon pond gets a lot of fertilizer, essentially, a lot of nitrogen and phosphorus, just poop in general. And algae and duckweed and all that kind of stuff can actually live in that. So when the algae and duckweed are getting all that fertilizer, their oxygen levels in that lagoon pond go really high up during the daytime. But at night, what happens? Boom, they tank. So at Lake Cumberland, we don't have, we still get the rise and fall, but not like we would in a pond or in a lake that's got a lot of nutrient inputs and a lot of algae growth. I mean, to the point that it's like green slimy with algae. So those have a lot of oxygen during the daytime and then it crashes at night and then it repeats the next day, crashes. Lake Cumberland will go up and down, up and down at a much more reasonable level. Um, so it's able to support fish. So those lagoon ponds cannot support fish.
All right, so that's all for this particular video. The next one we're going to go um, more into um, biochemical oxygen demand, and then we'll also um, really spend most of our time on some of the water chemicals that you might.